Again, good morning to everyone. There's a powerful statement that this text gives to us that I want to begin with, and that is, Hannah wanted to be a mother. That was the desire of her heart. She really thought that she would be a good mother, and she wanted to do so. Admittedly, in the times in which these people lived, the idea of motherhood was even greater respected than now. But yet she wanted to be a mother. In our day and time, it is unfortunate that sometimes children uh, for a woman are more of a problem. They're more of a hindrance. They take away from the life that the mother, the woman, wanted to live. In fact, there are some women who believe that the idea of having children undermines and degrades women in general. How sad is that concept? And it is because of that mindset that children actually get in the way of life. They, they get in the way of us doing what we want to do <clears throat> because of that. Uh, abortion has been on the rise for decades. But in this story, here is a woman in this story who had not been able to have children. And so children to her were a value. She desired to be a mother. I want you today to think with me about this woman and the powerful lesson that she teaches to all who are mothers the powerful lesson that she teaches to all young ladies who intend and desire one day to be mothers, and the lesson that she teaches to all of us, men included, about what it means to be in the place that God has made for us. I want to have you think about with me three words. And if you can hold on to these three words today, you will understand the summary of the life of Hannah, the mother of Samuel. Think with me, if you will, just three words. I'll give them to you now, and we will look at them as we proceed. I want you to think of the word consistent, insistent and persistent. Go with me now to 1 Samuel chapter 1 and we think today about a mother like Hannah. I want to suggest to you in the first place that Hannah was a mother who was consistent. She gave herself to the Lord. The text says in chapter 1 that she did what she did, verse 7, year by year. She was consistent. Now her story is a sad story. <clears throat> it begins in a sad place. Hannah was one of two women married to the same man. This situation was not good. The one woman, Penina, had children, but Hannah had not had children. And therefore, she was obviously slighted in her mind. She was depressed. She had problems. She really wanted to have a child. <clears throat> and yet in her defense, she was consistent in her life, even though things had not turned out exactly physically as she would have wanted. She was consistent. She was consistent in her worship of God, verse 3. Every year, she would go to Jerusalem for the purpose of worship. That's because that's what the Jews were required to do. 
And so she would go every year and fulfill her duty. Notice she was consistent in worshiping the Lord, even though the Lord had not blessed her with children. She didn't hold it against him. She didn't act in a way that took away from God because she didn't have children. She was consistent every year going to worship. Number two, she was consistent in her life even though she was persecuted by her family. The woman, the other wife, in fact, the text says in chapter 1, verse number 4, uh, let's see, verse number 6, that her rival provoked her severely. And she did so by saying, because the Lord had closed her womb. It was true that the people of the time gave the Lord credit for every single thing that happened, whether positive or good. The Lord had blessed Penina because she had children. The Lord had not blessed Hannah because he had actually closed her ability to have children. Now, I'm not sure <clears throat> whether God had specifically said Hannah's not going to have children. I don't know. It doesn't matter. In their minds, that's what the case was, and yet it didn't matter. She was consistent with her approach to God, faithful to God, even though that had not turned out well, and the other wife abused her. But notice, if you will, another abuse. Look at verse number 8. Elkanah, her husband, shows us sometimes how we men <clears throat> can be and not think well. We, our minds don't work well sometimes. And, and we say things because we don't understand. He could not understand the problem, even though she didn't have a child. Notice what he said to her. Why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? <laughs> he just didn't get it. He didn't understand what it was like to be a woman and to want to bear a child. And he had the audacity to say, am I not better than if you had ten sons? And in the face of that persecution, she was consistently faithful. That's what faithfulness is. Consistency in even persecution. Number three, she was consistent, faithful in her own discouragement. You know the text. The story was that she wept and grieved. When they went to Jerusalem on this day, this time of worship, she was off by herself grieving and weeping. It really bothered her that she did not have. In fact, the text says in verse 10, she had a bitterness of soul. It bothered her so deeply that she didn't have a child. Her <clears throat> depression, her grief was so bad that while she mourned and grieved, she was moving her lips and praying and talking, but no sound was coming out. And the priest Eli saw her and he said, Woman, you should not be drinking. Get away from the alcohol and the intoxicating drink. She said, I have had neither of those. I have not drunk. I am a woman who is grieved in my soul. <clears throat> even in her own discouragement, even in her own disappointment, she was faithful. She was consistent, still with the Lord. Fourth, she was faithful then to the word of the Lord. When Eli heard that she had grief, he said to her, go your way and may the Lord grant your prayer. Notice how this closes. Verse 18, her face was no longer sad. 
Now, she was not pregnant. She certainly didn't have a child. But because the priest, through the Lord, had told her a positive statement, she was consistent with the Lord, faithful to the word that she received from him, thinking and knowing she was going to be blessed and to have a child. Consistency is one of the great traits of godly mothers. Number two is the word insistent. She was insistent. She gave Samuel to the Lord. In the same way that she had given herself to the Lord, now she is going to give Samuel to the Lord. You see, she went home in a positive mental state because the Lord had spoken through the priest to say, in her mind, you're going to have a child. <clears throat> and indeed, that came about. However, before that happened, recall the prayer that she had said in verse number 11 of chapter 1. Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maid servant and remember me, and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. No razor shall come upon his head. Now you think about this woman. She was insistent. She was insistent as a woman, she gave Samuel to the Lord. I want you to back up or go to verse number 28 at the end of the chapter. And notice what it says. You see, in two ways, she gave, she gave Samuel to the Lord. She gave him to the Lord before he was even born. She said right in this verse 11, I'm going to give him back to you. <clears throat> And in fact, she did that very thing. But notice what it says in verse 28, when she gave him to the Lord. Therefore, I also have lent him to the Lord as long as he lives. She was insistent. I want you to notice with me, this is a fascinating word, this word lent. It doesn't mean that she gave him, that the Lord could borrow him for a time, which is what we would think about lending, in fact. The text, the word actually means to ask, to beseech, to inquire, to beg. Not only did she beg the Lord to have a child, not only did the inner part of her yearn for a child, and she promised, if you give him to me, I'll lend him back to you. She begged him to give her a child, and this word lent means she begged God to take him. And isn't that powerful? You think about a woman whose purpose in life she thought was to have a child and did not have one. Persecuted by her own family because of it. Begging the Lord to give her a child. And when she had one, she begged the Lord to take him into his service. Godly mothers beg for their children to be in faithful service to the Lord. Number three, persistent. Hannah gave herself to the Lord. She gave Samuel to the Lord. And then in her persistent life, she gave the Lord to Samuel. When the child was born, the text says she named him Samuel. 
because the Lord has heard my cry. And the name Samuel means just that. The Lord has heard me. By naming Samuel that way, she was giving the Lord to Samuel. The letters E-L. His name probably was pronounced something along the lines of Samuel. E-L is God. That's the name, part of the name of God, Elohim. Hannah put God's name in Samuel's name so that he walked around every day carrying the name of God. She gave the Lord to Samuel in his name. Number two, she gave the Lord to Samuel in her actions. After the child was born, it came time to go to Jerusalem for worship again. And this time she did not go. In fact, she said, no, I'm going to stay here until the child is weaned. And then I will present him to the Lord. Now, <clears throat> technically, the idea is she's nursing the child, which obviously makes sense. But there's a lot more to it. Weaning of a child is not just about providing nourishment physically. She also provided nourishment mentally and spiritually. Her weaning process was about teaching and training and preparing him for what he was going to do. You think about this. You think about the idea that she wanted this child so badly and she knows that she's going to put him in full-time service to the Lord, not to live with her anymore. How did she get him ready for that? She had to train him and prepare him. How could a child understand when a mother puts a child in a different place and walks off and leaves him? She prepared him well. It reminds me of Moses when Pharaoh's daughter found him in the water. His own mother was hired to nurse him, to wean him. You think she didn't train him and prepare him and teach him and provide everything he needed while he was going to be away from her? You know the great leader Moses became. And Samuel became a great leader as well because his mother was persistent, giving him what she had. He became a great leader. Tonight we're actually going to see how all of us need to be children like Samuel. This mother like Hannah concept can be transferred into a lesson for all of us, understanding how Samuel is a great example for us. For as children of God, we need to be like Samuel. And it's all because, in a great part, his godly mother. But finally, we have our three words <clears throat> she's consistent. She's insistent and she's persistent. And that's a good summary of a godly mother. But now we close with chapter 2. Chapter 2 opens with Hannah praising God. In all that happened, in everything she went through, in all that was laid out in front of her, finally, she gave all the credit to the Lord. <clears throat> she said, verse 1, You are my joy. My heart rejoices in the Lord. 
She rejoiced because she had a child. She rejoiced because she was granted that opportunity. But she rejoiced even though she went through her troubles. She rejoiced when she left him, chapter 1, in the care of Eli at the temple. The joy of her life was seeing her child in full-time service to the Lord. What joy do you get from your children? What gives you the greatest joy? Is it good grades and a report card? Is it skill in various talents and traits that they exhibit? Is it conquest on a competitive sports field? Or is it seeing your children learn about the Lord? Do you find your joy there? She did, even though she gave him full time to the Lord. She said, you are my strength. Verses 8 through 10, especially verse 10, He will give strength to His king and exalt the horn of His anointed. The strength that she had to leave Samuel there at the temple in the care of Eli, where did she get it? It came from the Lord. Where did she find the opportunity and the ability to do what she did? It came from the Lord. Her strength came from the Lord. And therefore, the Lord gave her return in a strong leader for the people of God. Finally, third, she said, Lord, you are my treasure. You are my treasure. Verse 4 Verses 4 through 6. I treasure you above all other things. You are the highest. You take care of me. You always have and you always will. The Lord blessed her with more children. Children that she raised in her home. But we don't know about those other children. We do know about the one child that she put in full-time service to the Lord at the temple. Every year coming to him to see him and bringing him a new coat. But every year being joyful and strong and treasuring the fact that he was in service to the Lord. Today, we honor the concept of motherhood through this great example of Hannah. And in so doing, we honor God because God designed it. When the other wife persecuted Hannah because her womb had been closed, you know what she was actually doing? Persecuting the Lord. Because if the Lord closed the womb and she's tormenting her, she's actually criticizing the Lord. When we have a day like this to honor mothers through this example, we're actually honoring God. Because God's greatness providing for us the way to have this kind of family life, how could it even be better? As God has always provided for us, He provided for us eternally through Jesus. I know that you are grateful for that. Today, if you are not a child of God, it is a day that you can say, Honoring your godly mother by saying today, on this Mother's Day, I want to be immersed into Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of my sins. It will make your mother joyful. If you're not a faithful child of God, it will make your mother happy. If you say today, on this day, I want to get my life right with the Lord. If we can help you with that, give us a call. Let us help you be right with God, and it will be a pleasing thing for your mother. Thank you all for joining us today. May God bless all of us. 
May God bless our country and world. May God bless our church.